Welcome, John, to our fireside chat <laughs> about quantum computing. Hi, Hi Jennifer. So, this should be fun. Hi. Yes, it should be. I'm looking forward to it. Um, obviously, we're about one year out from last year's bombshell announcement of uh, Google achieving quantum supremacy. I know at the time there was some back and forth with, with IBM about just how much faster their computer was compared to a, a, a classical computer. I want to take a moment to kind of look back on that announcement a year later. Where are we now? How do we feel about the announcement? Whether, you know, how, are we still skeptical? Um, it, is it is as are we really in this new era of NISC, as you so call it? Um, give me an idea of how you feel about this one year in. Well, I think the demonstration of quantum computational supremacy was a milestone worthy of note. Google built uh, an impressive piece of hardware. They had 53 working qubits. They were able to do 20 layers of entangling quantum gates. And although it was a noisy device and the final result um, had a small probability of being correct, they could run their simulation millions of times in just a few minutes and extract some statistically useful results. And simulating what that device Sycamore does with a classical computer is hard. I think you were referring to some back and forth about what the classical cost is of doing that simulation. Um, I think the state of the art now is there's a nice paper from the Alibaba group that described a method for doing the simulation, which arguably would take something like 20 days. Still a pretty big gap between what Sycamore can do in a few minutes and what uh, you know a state of the art supercomputer can do in, uh, in days. And perhaps more to the point, the cost of doing that classical simulation grows very rapidly as you increase the number of qubits. So if you, if you go from 53 to 60 to 70 and so on, it quickly becomes quite out of reach for the classical computer to keep up. Now, what does it really mean in practical terms? Well, it doesn't really mean anything in practical terms. <laughs> the demonstration's purpose was to show there's something that a quantum computer can do, which is just too hard for a classical computer to do. So that means we can start looking for potential applications where the quantum computer performs a task that the classical one couldn't possibly do, but the particular task performed by Sycamore was not one of practical interest. And where we go from here is not so clear. We're going to be in the era of heuristic quantum algorithms. There are a bunch of ideas about how we can use these noisy devices in the near term to do something interesting, but nothing's for sure. We're going to have to experiment with the devices and get a better idea of what they're capable of. Right. But it does feel like we are in entering a new phase of quantum computing. I mean, there was a time when there were people who honestly thought it was never going to be possible. And I think we're well past that now. Well, there's no question that the situation has changed a lot in the last few years. The technology has continued to advance steadily. And one thing that happened more quickly than I expected is, is the sharp ramping up of interest and investment from industry, uh, which is still ongoing. And of course, that's a good thing. It helps to accelerate progress. It creates opportunities for young people entering the field. Uh, but we have to be careful not to have unrealistic expectations about the time scale for quantum computing to have a practical impact. We really don't have a clear understanding at this point of what that time scale is going to be. Mm -hmm. So I want to take a moment to sort of go into what we might call the quantum rumor mill. Uh, shortly after the Google announcement, uh, John Martinez actually left Google and he was one of their you know key figures. And now I think he's working in Australia. Um, there's been some speculation about what would actually happen there and how this might impact um, his, you know, Google's program going forward. I mean, what was the difference? What was the difference of opinion there? Well, I'm sure the Google team will continue to do excellent work and advance the technology. John was an outstanding leader of that effort and a real visionary in quantum information science going back um, many years. But it's a very strong team, and you know they're going to continue uh, to do really interesting work. 
what was kind of uh, surprising uh, to many of us was that John landed in a company, Silicon Quantum Computing in Australia, a Michelle Simmons startup, which uh, is not focused on superconducting technology. John had spent most of his career working with Josephson Junction devices, um, leading to his leadership of the Google team. Uh, now he's going to be contributing to a very different hardware approach. Uh, using spin qubits associated with donors in silicon. At least I think that's what silicon quantum computing is going to be doing. John uh, thinks that he has uh, insights into the challenges of how to scale up quantum computing um, and uh, that those insights can be transferred across platforms. And it'll be interesting to watch what happens. Right. So, of course, there's a lot one of, of the other things stuff that... going on that's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Please. <laughs> well, well, there's a lot of say, other stuff uh, going on. Uh, yeah, and in fact, a lot of the companies who are going to be uh, represented at uh, Q2B have had uh, interesting announcements and developments um, in, uh, in just the last few months. Uh, IBM rolled out a kind of roadmap, which seems rather aggressive. <laughs> uh, they're planning to have a device with over a thousand qubits by 2023. They're making plans for a gigantic dilution refrigerator that down the road would be able to hold millions of qubits. And they're starting to talk about connecting fridges together to scale things up further. And Google also has some plans about giant fridges for future devices. And I think they too are starting to look at alternative hardware approaches. I think their plan for a while was to take the hardware they have now and run with it to try to scale it up, in particular do quantum error correction, but they'd really like to have hardware that's better, that has gate error rates, maybe a factor of 10 better, and that's really challenging, and it might require looking at the hardware differently. The truth is these superconducting qubits, they were the first uh, ones that weren't really terrible, um, and they were <laughs> able to take us this far, uh, it's based on the, the Transmon, which, uh, you know, came out of the Yale group over 15 years ago, about 15 years ago, and it hasn't changed much since then. And uh, to take the next st step forward in qubit quality is maybe going to take some new ideas. And meanwhile, uh, ion traps are, uh, are stepping up. Uh, that was the quantum technology that really first... Uh, came to the fore back in the mid 90s uh, with uh, the work of uh, Dave Wineland's group initially. And now uh, there are a couple of companies, uh, Honeywell and IonQ that have, uh, have rolled out machines. Actually, uh, Honeywell has an approach, an architecture, an idea for scaling things up that goes back to the Wineland group back in the 1990s. Very challenging, but they're trying to put all the pieces together to make that happen. IonQ has announced they have a 32 qubit device with all to all connectivity, interesting device. Uh, meanwhile, on the ion trap front in uh, academia, in fact, uh, Chris Monroe, who was the co-founder of IonQ, uh, his group in Maryland did a, a, a nice recent demonstration of, of quantum error correction using an ion trap device. That was kind of a milestone. And, uh, Actually, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, is starting to get into the game. I have some connection with that since they are establishing a center at Caltech, and I'm an Amazon scholar spending a part of my time uh, in that effort. So, yeah, there are a lot of interesting stuff happening. You know, I was uh, actually going to move into the Ion Trap uh uh, device, specifically uh, IonQ's device, because the CEO, Peter Chapman, has made some very bold claims, uh, claiming that he can actually, that they plan to increase the number of qubits, essentially double them every eight months uh, for the next couple of years. Um, that seems even more ambitious than IBM's roadmap for their for their approach. Um, so I'm curious as we think this is even possible. I mean, you know, how, how, what needs to happen in order to get scaling up of that magnitude? Well, I'm not sure how they're planning to do it, actually. Uh, in the case of the Honeywell approach, you know, they have in mind having a bunch of small groups of ions and then connecting those together by moving the ions around. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of uh, IonQ, uh, they could put more than 32 ions in a single trap um, and they could do some shuttling of the ions around. But to continue doubling, uh, 
that requires probably a leap from a single trap to some multiplex traps to traps that can share quantum information. And uh, they have a long-term vision about how to do that with optical interconnects between traps, but that's a technology which um, still has a ways to go, I think, before it, uh, it can be part of a practical system. So we'll see. I mean, it's good to have bold plans. <laughs> And uh, that can help to drive progress sometimes, but we, we have to be cautious about not having uh, expectations that are not likely to be fulfilled. Right. So um, I want to move on. Uh, another thing that was announced most recently in September, D-Wave has a new quantum annealing device. Uh, D-Wave, of course, was one of the early players in the quantum computing landscape. Um, not no stranger to controversy. I'm curious as to why they're they're focusing on this this quantum annealing device in particular, which is limited to a certain kind of problem, optimization and minimization problems. So maybe we can talk a little bit about their new device. Um, also, they have some new software I think that's associated with it. Um, what it's good for, um, what some of the applications are, and why this might be a good a good mid midway step to, towards what's the future of quantum computing. Well, it's, it's impressive technology to be able to build and, and operate a 5,000 qubit device. There's a lot of good engineering in there. It's a different approach than most of the other companies and most of the academic groups are pursuing. Uh, D-Wave isn't trying to build a circuit-based universal quantum computer. They're building what we call a quantum annealer for approximately solving optimization problems. And uh, the device really does solve problems, so that's pretty cool. But we don't yet have convincing evidence that it can achieve a practical advantage over the best classical algorithms run on the best classical hardware. And theorists haven't been that successful in answering the question, does the D-Wave approach really have a prospect of achieving quantum advantage? So I think we're going to have to continue to experiment with the uh, devices and understand better what they can do. Right. I assume that, you know, it needs to be, there needs to be this obvious trade-off, you know, it needs to be better because otherwise why invest the extra money to have a quantum computer? Is that correct? I mean, well, sure. is it possible we don't that there could... <laughs> if, we, if the quantum computer can't do uh, something that classical <laughs> computers can't do, then we're barking up the wrong tree, aren't we? Yes, we are. Um, so I want to talk a couple of uh, about a couple of dark horse candidates. Um, probably the first dark horse is something that's very cool from a physics standpoint, which is topological quantum computing, and it's something that Microsoft has been leaning very heavily into. But it's also one of those things that, while it might be exciting in terms of foundational physics and things, there are some serious challenges in terms of making it making a viable quantum compute. A computer out of this particular method. So let's talk a little bit about topological quantum computing, you know, where we stand now. Um, what are some of the, the challenges that they face going forward in order to become a true contender in what's becoming kind of a crowded market? Well, topological quantum computing is, without question, a very beautiful idea. It was first proposed by my Caltech colleague, Alexei Kataev. It's been 23 years since he made the proposal. The idea is to build suitable material. So quantum information encoded in that material will have a natural resistance to error, which will potentially make the hardware much more reliable than more conventional approaches to building qubits. Microsoft has pursued that idea since um, the mid 2000s. I guess it's been about 15 years. And they've uh, seeded a lot of scientific progress, which I think, as you indicated, from a fundamental physics point of view, is, uh, is very interesting. But even after 15 years of effort, we still haven't seen a demonstration of a topologically protected qubit, which is not to say that that's not going to happen. I think it eventually will happen, but it is an indication of how challenging it is to make the idea of topological quantum computing work. A lot of the issues have to do with materials and building materials that have all the right properties, putting together all the ingredients that a topological computer needs to be well protected against error. Um, 
there's a vision of how to do that, but it's just hard. Uh, materials progress sometimes is slow, you know, and mm -hmm. um, it's a, a technology which potentially could be disruptive if it, if it really takes, up, takes off. Um, I hope that will happen, but we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. So an even darker horse, so to speak, uh, there was just a paper on the archive in the last couple of weeks by Xanadu about using uh, states of light. Um, it, it's a process, a, a, an approach that you actually described some 20 years ago that you called GKP qubits. Let's talk a little bit about that. That's not a topic, uh, that's not an area that I'm especially familiar with. It's fairly new uh, in terms of uh, how, how much work has been done on it. Um, is this another place that we actually could be a, another serious contender uh, for, for future breakthroughs? Yeah, GKP, uh, the letters are the initials of me and my collaborators, uh, Daniel Gottesman, <laughs> Alexei Kataev, and me. And you're right, we proposed that about 20 years ago. Uh, the idea was to uh, take a system like a photonic system and encode information in a way which had uh, nice robustness properties and resistance to error. And um, in the case of photonic quantum computing, the vision is to realize what people call measurement-based quantum computing. You make an entangled state, and then by measuring the photons, you're able to process the information. And part of that is not so hard. It involves sort of standard nonlinear optics, but the part that's not so hard is also not so interesting because it allows us to do a quantum computation, which is easy to simulate classically, you had to add another ingredient in there to make it a universal quantum computer that can do any possible quantum computation. And ideally, you'd like to do that with some error resistance. And that's where the, the GKP states come in. I think Xanadu, uh, to their credit, sort of laid out their vision of where they want to go. They have an ambitious plan. Uh, there are a lot of technical challenges that they'll have to face, like doing very rapid optical switching, but I think uh, they understand what they have to do, and it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I would put that in the, in the broader context of approaches to putting some air resistance into the hardware itself, and there are other developments in that direction. Of course, topological quantum computing is sort of the grand version of that, but also in the, in the superconducting and uh, ion trap platforms, there's a possibility of using these GKP qubits, and we've seen a recent uh, progress on that, both from the Yale group and, uh, and the ETH group in, in Zurich, and, and I think that's exciting and promising. And there's another approach, which I think is extremely interesting, which came out of Yale and Paris, which is to use what we call cat qubits. And the idea there is that if you design the hardware right, you can make certain kinds of errors occurring in the quantum state extremely rare, while other errors are, are more prevalent. And that makes the error correction task easier. Uh, you can focus your error correcting power on the errors that occur, the lo occur a lot and not worry so much about the errors that are infrequent. And that could improve scalability. It could mean that to get to very low error rates, as we would like to, to make quantum computing really scalable, uh, we won't need to use as many qubits and as and many gates. And, and I'm excited about that approach too. Excellent. Well, I could talk to you for at least another half hour, but we are running out of time. So now final question, uh, and this is like the moment of truth. How do we feel about the state of quantum computing here at, in fall of 2020? And what do you see as the, the big breakthroughs or challenges that are likely to happen uh, in the next year or two? Well, of course, one big question we're facing is, can we do something interesting with these uh, NIST <laughs> devices? Uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum is what NIST stands for. Uh, intermediate scale means they're not easy to simulate classically. Noisy means there's a real limitation on their power because uh, there's a limit to how large quantum computation we can do. Uh, can we do something of practical interest with those? The other big question is, how are we going to scale things up? Uh, can we realize quantum error correction, which will make error rates sufficiently low that we can run uh, big algorithms that solve really hard problems? So we'd like to lower the overhead cost of error correction, but with better hardware performance, we can make that cost much less. So 
that's also a very Excellent. important goal. Great. Well, thank you so much, John, for taking this time to talk to us. Oh, I wish we had more time, Jennifer. It was a lot of fun. I know. I know. It's, it's, I, I, could, I have so many more questions I would want to ask you.